today we have an exciting lecture and an exciting presenter. Um, Adam, Adam Durbin is a member of the faculty at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in the Division of Molecular Oncology, Department of Oncology and the Developmental Biology and Solid Tumor Program. His team works to understand how transcriptional regu regulatory circuitries establish malignant cell identity, and how these circuitries can be perturbed for clinical benefit using conventional and novel small molecules. Today's lecture is targeting transcriptional addiction in high-risk pediatric cancers, and we're going to learn some interesting things. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam, and uh, welcome, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, let me just share my screen. Guys, is this visible? We're good. We can see it. All right, great. Um, so uh, thank you, Jay, and, and thanks to the, you know, Liz and Brenna and Judy Oliver and all the folks at Alex's um, for inviting me to, to speak today. Uh, that's some of the work that we've been, we've been doing over the last several years um, and now uh, continue to work on in, uh, in my lab here at uh, St. Jude. And so the, the title is, as you said, Jay, is Targeting Transcriptional Addiction in High-Risk Pediatric Cancers. Um, I do not have, is this, there we go. Um, I have no disclosures. And um, before I start, I just want to point out um, just how prevalent Alex's lemonade stand is. Um, so this is a picture uh, uh, my wife and I took uh, when we were on vacation. And I don't know if you guys can see, um, we're somewhere in the Caribbean, and uh, this is actually an Alex's lemonade stand juicer um, that was uh, present at the at the bar. So um, whether whether you are a researcher, a, a clinician, or um, a person who is not involved with this or, or touched in some way uh, by uh, pediatric cancer, I think it's it's fair to say that the the reach of Alex's lemonade stand is everywhere. Um, and so I am really, uh, really quite proud to be uh, invited to, to give this talk today. And so, uh, as Jay said, the, the learning objectives for the talk today, uh, really we're going to talk about how functional genomics has led to, uh, has allowed us to identify transcriptional circuitries that drive uh, malignant cell identity. Um, I'm going to describe how these circuitries that we've defined can actually be perturbed in, in exciting and interesting ways to force different malignant cells to acquire new cell states. And then I'm going to talk about some of our efforts in preclinical technologies that we've, um, that we've been working on in order to try to target transcription and um, force cells into uh, these new cell states. And so I'm a, I'm a pediatric solid tumor oncologist, and uh, initially as a resident and then as a clinical fellow, um, I was struck by this problem. And so this is a, a problem, high-risk neuroblastoma. Um, and here you can see in this Kaplan-Meier's survival curve, uh, the overall survival probability is a function of time. This is taken from a recent COG uh, publication. And what you can see are really two things. The first is that despite our best efforts, uh, children who are diagnosed with this with this tumor uh, still have somewhere around a, a 50 to 60 percent overall survival. And the second thing um, that you can take from this is that treatment ends usually around 18 months to 24 months, and children are continuing. Um, to die of this disease uh, beyond that. So this is a clinical problem that um, we that was quite striking to me and uh, led me to uh, think more about. And so in combination with folks at the Broad Institute and at Dana-Farber, uh, we used a, a new resource called DEPMAP um, in order to try to define new therapeutic targets for this disease to derive both more on-target therapies as well as uh, therapies that potentially um, could have reduced toxicity. We've used these new targets to define transcriptional models, and, and I'm showing you uh, one here that we published in 2018, um, and this has actually uh, formed the basis for a lot of our work going forward. And what I'll describe today is how we've harnessed these transcriptional models to understand how they can be perturbed to control cell state um, using different agents. I'm showing you here 
uh, an agent, uh, cis-retinoic acid, which is clinically used in this disease, and indeed also how we can use um, these circuitries in, in interesting new ways to develop new chemicals, um, including one called j which I'll describe, uh, which has uh, in preclinical models some uh, very exciting new effects. And so just to start this talk, really what I'm going to start talking about is the scope of this problem in pediatric oncology and how we can use pediatric cancer functional genomics. So this is a, a figure um, taken from the SEER program at the National Cancer Institute. Here what you're seeing is a distribution of pediatric cancer uh, in children aged under 15 years. And so what you can see is that um, there's a relatively even split uh, between children diagnosed with leukemias and uh, solid tumors. So solid tumors make up a pretty significant chunk of all of the cancers that we diagnose. And once again, here's that overall survival curve of children diagnosed with high-risk neuroblastoma. This is a particularly common solid tumor that we see. And despite our best efforts, children uh, diagnosed with this disease really continue to display um, insufficient cure. And so this really tells us um, that we need to derive new therapeutic uh, modalities. Now, this what, what you don't get from this curve is what the actual realities of treatment are. And so I think it's important to highlight that children who are diagnosed with neuroblastoma will receive therapy that looks something like this. And so here uh, you can see kids will get somewhere between five and six cycles of multi-agent chemotherapy. They'll have surgery. They'll have radiation. They'll have two uh, courses of high-dose chemotherapy that is uh, myeloablative, and then they will then go on to have autologous stem cell rescue, and then follow that with somewhere between six and seven months or so of immunotherapy and retinoic acid. And at the end of all of this therapy, they have a, about a 60% chance of, of survival. And so with all of this therapy uh, comes a number of uh, downstream consequences, including toxicity. And so uh, many children who are diagnosed with high-risk neuroblastoma will have long-term late effects from all of this therapy, including cardiac damage, a risk of secondary cancers, infertility, problems with growth, and hearing loss, amongst many other uh, late effects. And so the problem isn't just that our treatments are insufficient. The problem is, in addition to this, that our treatments are extremely toxic. And so what this, again, this gets at the same point, what we really need is to derive novel therapeutics. And in order to do that, we need to know what the right targets are to go after. And so this has led many to ask questions around the mutational spectrum of pediatric cancers. And so this is a figure taken from Stefan Grobner's paper in Nature in 2018. And this is a, a concept that is very well understood in the field, and that is that in general, pediatric cancer genomes have a very low mutational rate, especially when compared with adult cancers. And what this means ultimately is that oftentimes pediatric cancers don't have a smoking gun oncogene that's mutated that allows us to derive a small molecule um, that we can use in order to target it. And so this leads to a key question, which is how do we identify the best targets in pediatric cancers? And from these mutational spectra, we were able to identify um, uh, Jingwei Zhang's group here at, at St. Jude and, and several others identifying similar uh, effects across pediatric cancers that, in fact, um, the mutational spectra is actually enriched in pediatric cancers for a number of different uh, processes, including transcriptional processes, epigenetics, MYC pathways, cohesin, and RNA processing, all involved in really regulation of transcription. And so as a, as a fellow and now uh, in my own laboratory, I've been really very fortunate to be part of a consortium called the DEPMAP Consortium. Um, and uh, this, uh, all the data that I'm going to discuss is actually publicly available at www.depmap.org. So I would encourage you to, if you, if you don't know about this resource, to um, access it and, and look up your favorite genes. And essentially, DEPMAP is a functional genomics and functional uh, chemical biology approach to trying to identify those genes that are specifically important in different types of cancer. 
And the the approach which um, uh, is sort of illustrated here, and that is you start with a, a, a group of cancer cell lines that are thought to represent different aspects of a primary tumor. Um, those are profiled for their baseline genetic and molecular features using technologies like whole exome sequencing and RNA sequencing, methylation profiling, copy number variation, and so on. Um, those same cell lines are then taken through a combination of genetic and chemical perturbation screening. Um, and that includes uh, chemical repurposing screens and probably the most, the most famous or sort of well-known um, approaches, really whole exome uh, CRISPR-Cas9 dropout screening. And this data, this enormous amount of data is then fused through a, a advanced computational analysis. And the idea here is to try to derive a therapeutic hypothesis, identify some gene that results in, in, um, a, that is in some way required in, in a specific cancer. And so this is a, a schematic of a, um, exome wide CRISPR Cas9 dropout screen here. Uh, individual cancer cell lines are infected with uh, lentiviruses expressing uh, guide RNAs against a target um, of choice. And in, in this case, the guide RNAs target essentially every gene in the, in the exome, with some exceptions. Um, these cells are pooled, they're grown for several weeks, and then uh, DNA is extracted. And if the guide RNA targets a gene that's required for cell viability, um, those cells will die. Those guide RNAs will not be found at the end when you sequence them, and so it's a dropout screen. And uh, recently, uh, uh, we, along with um, really led by Nikesh Daria and uh, Paquita Vasquez and Kim Stegmeier at the Broad and, and uh, Dana Farber, um, uh, published the first map of these genes, um, which are uh, 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 required within different uh, solid tumor. Uh, cancer cell lines. And so here, um, close to uh, a little over 80 cancer cell lines, um, where we now have a whole exome CRISPR-Cas9 data, again, entirely publicly available. And um, as, as my lab uh, knows very well and all of our collaborators, we have taken advantage of this data in a number of different high-risk solid tumors, including rhabdomyosarcoma, osteosarcoma, neuroblastoma, and uh, indeed uh, brain tumors such as medulloblastoma to try to understand uh, specific genes that are required in these different tumors and how they function as a way of trying to provide insight into developing new therapies for these diseases. And so what does this, this data actually look like? Well, this is sort of what the data looks like when you look at it on the browser um, here at debmap.org. Uh, there are three different situations here, and I want to uh, just quickly run through this. Here, what you can see um, is a, uh, a plot, for example, for this gene, OR4S2. Um, each of these individual lines is a different cancer cell line. And here, what you can see uh, is um, that when you knock out OR4S2, uh, the effect is mean-centered here around a gene effect score of zero. And this indicates that knockout of OR4S2 really has very minimal effects on any cancer cell line. And so this gene is essentially dispensable um, from that uh, perspective. On the other hand, when you knock out this gene, TOP2A or topoisomerase, what you see is a very left shift within this distribution. Here, um, essentially every cancer cell line dies in response to loss of this gene. This is something we call a pan-lethal. And then what the screen was initially designed to do um, and many years ago was to try to identify genes that are selectively required in different cancer cells. And so in this case, you can see there is this gene ISL1. Loss of ISL1 causes death of some cancers, but in fact has really very, very little or no effect at all in the majority of cancers. And in fact, these cancer cell lines where ISL1 loss is lethal are all high-risk neuroblastoma cell lines. And we had identified this gene, which is a transcription factor, as a dominant member of a regulatory circuitry along with um, uh, and Nikesh Daria and Kim Stegmeier and a number of other folks uh, back in 2018. And 
What we now know from examining this data, especially looking at pediatric cancers compared with adult cancers, is that the processes that are enriched in pediatric cancers are different than those that are enriched in adult cancers. And in particular, um, transcription factors are really the number one um, most important group of selected dependencies in pediatric cancers within this data set as compared with adults, uh, adult cancer cell lines. And so I, harnessing this data, I want to now move on and talk a little bit about um, this concept of transcriptional addiction in pediatric solid tumors. And, and really, I, at this point, it probably makes sense for me to introduce neuroblastoma. I've talked a lot about it, um, and it's a, a disease that's very well known to um, probably most folks on this call. But I, I will say neuroblastoma, this is um, the most common extracranial solid tumor of childhood. It, it makes up nearly 10% of all of our childhood cancer diagnoses. And despite our best efforts, it still makes up about 15% of all childhood cancer deaths. This is an MIBG scan, which is a, uh, a, a scan that is oftentimes done at diagnosis of patient, uh, uh, at patient diagnosis with um, metastatic neuroblastoma. This is unfortunately um, not the exception. This is actually what most patients look like um, at diagnosis. So this is a very challenging to treat disease. Um, neuroblastoma is an embryonal malignancy. It's thought to be derived from uh, neural crest cells that make up the peripheral sympathetic nervous system. And uh, much like many other pediatric cancers, it's characterized by a very low mutational rate. Um, however, uh, neuroblastoma is commonly characterized by dysregulation of MYC family genes, um, which are, in fact, uh, transcription factors. And so dating back to the, to the 80s, uh, Garrett Berdur and a number of other folks had identified that um, the MYCN transcription factor was heavily amplified in up to about a third of cases of high-risk neuroblastoma. In addition, now we know that many other cases have very high-level expression of this gene that is independent of MCN amplification, um, a, caused by a stabilization of the protein, and indeed, um, as we showed uh, with Mark Zimmerman um, in Tom Look's lab uh, in 2018, that um, the related CMIC transcription factor is uh, very highly expressed by enhancer hijacking in up to about 10% of cases. And MYC proteins, which are transcription factors, have a variety of different effects on the cancer cell. Um, and one particular activity that they, uh, that they have is by amplifying transcriptional output. And so in the setting of very low level expression of MYCN or, or uh, CMYC proteins, these transcription factors bind to EVOXs and the promoters of target genes and drive um, transcriptional output. But as you drive up expression of uh, MYC or CMYC or MYCN, all of these different proteins, what you get is a spillover effect. These proteins saturate EVOXs in the promoter and then move over to low affinity enhancers. And this causes a massive amplification and transcriptional output, leading to a high level expression of really all expressed genes within the cell. And so uh, way back when, we had been interested to ask a very simple question, and that is, what are the genes that are required for neuroblastoma cells to grow that are not required for other cancer subtypes? And what we identified was a distribution of different types of genes and, and in fact, an overrepresentation of genes that were annotated as either transcription factors or nucleic acid binding proteins. And it turns out that this, from a sort of meta-analysis of uh, DEPMAP data, is a common finding. And so here you can see a neuroblastoma. Transcription factors are, are some of the most um, dependent genes, these genes, ISL1, HAN2, FOX2B, and again, In Ewing sarcoma, you get FLY1 and TRIM8, which are regulators of transcription. And in rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, you see MyoD and PAX3 as some of the most um, enriched uh, transcription uh, or, uh, dependencies, all of which are involved in transcription in some way. Given that we had identified these uh, genes as transcription factors and nucleic acid binding proteins, we wondered how they were regulated. And in fact, I, at around the time, it had been fairly well established that there were two different modes of regulation by enhancers um, that drive gene expression. And so here you can see in this cartoon, 
uh, a typical enhancer shown here in E marked by a little bit of acetylation. This recruits uh, transcription factors in the RNA polymerase complex and drives low level expression of housekeeping genes. This is sort of a, a classic mode of uh, regulation for uh, typical enhancer regulated genes. And we can, we can actually see this by performing chip seek to this enhancer mark, this acetylation mark here at the RAD23B locus in high risk neuroblastoma. And so you can see here this promoter peak really right at the, at the start of the gene and then upstream this very small regular enhancer. In contrast, um, there are these elements, uh, rare elements within the genome called super enhancers, which are really just long chain together stretches of enhancers. And these are marked by a lot more enhancer acetylation. Um, they bind a lot more transcription factor and a lot more RNA polymerase and, and drive very, very high level expression of genes. And these genes tend to be cell identity genes and um, oncogenes. And so here in, again, in neuroblastoma, you see this extensive stretch of H3K27 acetylation here at the uh, cell identity gene in high-risk neuroblastoma, GATA3. And so given that we had identified all of these transcription factors, um, and transcription factors, of course, play a role in cell identity, we wondered if, in fact, they were regulated by super enhancers. And we went on to demonstrate by looking at a panel of neuroblastoma cell lines um, and, and comparing their H3K27 acetyl uh, profiles that we had resolved by ChIP-seq that, in fact, um, uh, the distribution of these genes was very similar uh, to what we had seen for dependency, and that was an enrichment of transcription factors and nucleic acid binding proteins. And when we pushed these two data sets together, what we saw was a heavy enrichment for a very small number of transcription factors um, which were both required for cell growth and, and proliferation, but also um, marked by super enhancers, and they're all shown here. And in fact, subsequently, many others have demonstrated very similar findings in other diseases, including rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, acute myelogenous leukemia, and, and, and several others. And so how do these transcription factors work? And so we we hypothesized that since these transcription factors were marked by super enhancers and in fact were required for cell growth, that in fact they might be forming something called a core regulatory circuitry. And so a core regulatory circuitry is a, a stable a, arrangement of transcription factors that control uh, cell identity. And so here in the schematic, you can see there is a super enhancer that's driving uh, gene expression of a transcription factor, and this produces a protein product. And you might imagine a situation where that transcription factor loops back and binds to its own super enhancer to drive its own expression. And similarly, this doesn't have to be restricted to a single transcription factor. You can have multiple transcription factors that interact. And so here um, you can imagine you have three different transcription factors, each of which is producing a protein, which is in fact a transcription factor that loops back and binds to both its own super enhancer and each other's. And this, this is a stable arrangement by which these transcription factors can both regulate themselves and also each other. But it doesn't just end there. Um, in fact, these transcription factors are, are capable of both regulating themselves as well as going out and binding to both the super enhancers and typical enhancers of effector genes within the cell. And this is a concept that really comes from the embryonic stem cell literature where all of the ES cell reprogramming factors are in fact members of a core regulatory circuitry. And so this is a key point here. These transcription factors both regulate each other and establish a network uh, that um, uh, is autoregulatory, but also will go out and control gene expression throughout the rest of the cell by regulating downstream effector genes. And these core regulatory circuitries can actually be dysregulated in, in a number of different cancer cell states. And so this is uh, from a diagram from a, a paper that we have now in press um, at uh, Cell Reports Medicine. And so here you can imagine a balanced core regulatory uh, circuitry. This is sort of an endogenous uh, cell state. You have three different transcription factors and they're auto-regulating themselves to establish the transcriptome. And in cancer, uh, you can imagine a situation where you can acquire a novel oncogenic transcription factor, and this then uh, co-opts this regulatory circuitry to a new cell state. And this 
you might imagine is, is uh, the situation in the case of, for example, oncogenic transcription factors like EWS fly, Ewing sarcoma, or Pax3 voxo and rhabdomyosarcoma. Similarly, you might imagine that loss of a, of a tumor suppressive transcription factor could similarly dysregulate um, uh, this uh, sort of oncogenic uh, transcriptional circuitry. And then finally, probably the most common uh, way that these are dysregulated is by amplification of the circuitry. Um, and this is commonly uh, done by MYC proteins, which invade these super enhancers and drive very high level expression um, of these uh, transcriptional uh, proteins. And this is, in fact, what we see in multiple different types of cancer, including rhabdomyosarcoma, neuroblastoma, and medulloblastoma, amongst others. And it really leads to this key question, is there, in fact, a therapeutic window? And so we had identified a, a collection of, of proteins um, that were selectively required in neuroblastoma cells and weren't required in very many other different types of cancer. And when we took these uh, genes and we put them into a, uh, an interaction plotter called the string database, what we found was that they were highly interconnected. And that is, uh, in prior uh, literature reports, these proteins were known to interact with each other. And we got this dense interaction network of all of these different proteins. In green, you can see all of these uh, proteins that are transcription factors. And in red, um, you can see anything that is potentially druggable. And this led us to a model which we um, have demonstrated previously, whereby there are these um, transcription factors that form this dense core regulatory circuitry, which is invaded by MCN. And this is, in fact, what we see in adrenergic subtype um, uh, MCN amplified uh, high risk neuroblastoma. And so over the last several years, this has really been public enemy number one. We've been interested to try and figure out ways to target this um, core regulatory circuitry, knowing that essentially it's a house of cards. If you target any one member of this regulatory circuitry, the entire thing will collapse. And in fact, um, neuroblastoma will be committed uh, to apoptotic cell death. And we have targeted this using a number of different approaches um, which I'm going to describe today. And what we know is that, in fact, it's exceptionally difficult uh, to target transcription factors directly um, due to uh, unstructured domains um, and a, oftentimes a lack of binding pockets. And so this has led um, several uh, different groups to hypothesize that, in fact, uh, a good way of going about this might be to target um, epigenetic proteins that regulate uh, transcription, and that is the histone readers, uh, writers, erasers, and chromatin remodeling proteins. And there are a number of ways of doing this, including uh, classical inhibitors, as well as the sort of more recently described protax or proteolysis targeted chimeras, which I'll describe um, later in the talk. And indeed, um, this has led some to, to hypothesize that protax really are, are the panacea for um, for drug discovery, now being able to take out this uh, dragon, the undruggable target, uh, directly to the trash. But I will point out that, in fact, uh, we do not limit ourselves to protax. We're interested in peptidomimetics, inhibitors, molecular glues, peptides, and many other different agents um, for targeting uh, these different proteins. And so next, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of our efforts um, to think about clinical compounds and how they control and rewire these transcriptional processes. And in fact, I think of these as, as uh, sort of smart bombs, uh, targeted missiles that, that go after specific aspects of these um, wiring. Since, since the mid 80s, uh, it's been pretty well known that um, compounds like retinoic acid are capable of driving differentiation of high risk neuroblastoma. So this is a an image taken from Carol Teal and Pat Reynolds and Mark Israel's paper in Nature in 1985. And here you can see SMS KCNR, which is a high-risk neuroblastoma cell line. And in the presence of retinoic acid, you get production of these um, neurites, which is, which is quite indicative of cellular differentiation. And in fact, this is not just a cell culture trick. 
uh, patients who have high-risk neuroblastoma actually receive retinoic acid, and, and this has made an enormous improvement in their overall survival. And so here from Kate Bethay's uh, New England Journal uh, paper in 1999 reporting the, the very first trial um, in which patients uh, were treated both with retinoic acid as well as um, with uh, autotransplantation, and this led to a nearly 40% increase in event-free survival of patients. So this is a this is a clinically actionable um, and important uh, compound in the management of high-risk neuroblastoma, and and yet we didn't really understand how it was that retinoic acid was capable of deriving um, these effects. And so uh, in collaboration, um, in a project really led by Mark Zimmerman and Tom Look's lab, um, we went on to demonstrate that uh, what retinoic acid does uh, is really cause epigenetic silencing of some core regulatory circuitry loci. And so Mark took retinoic acid and treated uh, two different high-risk neuroblastoma cells with it and, and saw um, that, in fact, there was downregulation of MCN, GATA3, and FOX2B, three members of this core regulatory circuitry. And Mark could visualize this um, also by performing H3K27 acetyl chip seek and H3K27 trimethyl chip seek. And so here at the GATA3 and FOX2B locus, when these cells are treated with retinoic acid, they lose this enhancer acetylation and they gain trimethylation at the, at the, at the gene promoter and um, indeed over the, some of the enhancer elements. And this indicates that um, what retinoic acid was doing was in part the effects of this compound in any case were to cause epigenetic silencing. But I just finished telling you that in fact, loss of any member of the core regulatory circuitry causes cells to die. And in fact, that's not what we were seeing here. What we were seeing was that loss of some of the members of the core regulatory circuitry was driving differentiation. And so how could we rationalize this? In fact, uh, Mark went on to demonstrate that retinoic acid wasn't only causing downregulation of genes. In fact, some other transcription factors were being upregulated, including SOX4 and MICE1. And this was, in, in fact, also associated with a gain of enhancer acetylation here in DEGC and NGP cells. You can see this gain of a new enhancer acetylation um, at, for example, here the SOX4 locus. And, and so Mark went on to perform ChIP-seq and demonstrate here at loci that were not changed in expression, other core regulatory circuitry members like HAN2, that in fact what was happening was that they were losing occupancy by GATA3 and FOX2B, but gaining new occupancy by MICE1, SOX4, and RNR-alpha. And so in fact what was happening was that the uh, core regulatory circuitry wasn't just uh, falling apart, it was changing. There were new transcription factor members that were becoming a part of this uh, so-called retinosympathetic core regulatory circuitry, and this uh, uh, we thought was associated with differentiation of high-risk neuroblastoma cells. And Mark went on to demonstrate that actually when you treat these cells um, with retinoic acid, you get up regulation of these transcription factors, and this is reversible. Um, when you wash out retinoic acid, everything settles back down, um, including both the upregulation of the new transcription factors and downregulation of the old members. And he could see this at the protein level. And in fact, he could also see this morphologically. When cells were treated with retinoic acid, they formed these neurites. And when you washed it out, they went back to uh, being uh, similar to untreated cells. And so uh, finally, we wondered, was in fact the upregulation of these genes required for this new cell state? And so Mark generated BE2C cells with stable knockout of SOX4, and then looked to see what happened when he treated these with retinoic acid. And in fact, what he saw was a failure of these cells to drive up expression of other members uh, of the core reg of this new retinosympathetic core regulatory circuitry, such as MICE1 and uh, terminal differentiation markers like fibronectin. And so here, essentially, the message that retinoic acid causes this change um, in core regulatory circuitry members leading to a new cell fate. And similarly, um, we had been engaged in work with uh, folks in Colorado, Haida Ford and Kristen Artinger's group and a very talented uh, PhD student, Jessica Shu. 
And Jessica had noticed that in randomized sarcoma, another high-risk pediatric cancer, uh, that these um, tumor cell lines were heavily enriched for um, dependency on a gene called 6-1. Um, they were highly expressed here, and you can see here the gene effect is mostly negative uh, for these different rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma cell lines. And separately, we and several others had established that um, rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma was driven by a core regulatory circuitry. Uh, folks like Javed Khan and Berkeley Grider at the NIH and um, Beth Stewart uh, and Mike Dyer's groups here at uh, St. Jude had, had demonstrated occupancy of a core regulatory circuitry, including genes like MyoD, MCN, SOX8, and Myogenin. And we had actually separately implicated this gene 6-1 as a member of this core regulatory circuitry. And Jessica performed experiments in rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma cell lines to knock down 6-1. And what she saw was, again, differentiation. And so here, uh, RD cells, this is an embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma cell line. Um, here you can see in the resting state, uh, they really don't express any myosin heavy chain. But in the absence of 6-1 proteins, all of a sudden these cells start to differentiate. And perhaps not surprisingly, when Jessica xenografted these cells or used um, animal models, uh, uh, genetically engineered zebrafish in this case, um, she was able to demonstrate that these, uh, these cell lines were incapable of forming tumors, likely because they were terminally differentiated. And so together with Jessica, we wondered why was it, in fact, that these cells were incapable of, of forming tumors and what was controlling their differentiation? And Jessica went on to demonstrate by cut and run qPCR along with um, chip seq that in these cells, uh, when you knock down six one other members of this core regulatory circuitry change their occupancy and so here in r d cells when you knock down six one you lose the presence of myoD at a number of different stem and oncogenic loci and instead now you gain it at um the promoters of genes that are really driving cellular differentiation. And it led, led to this model whereby rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is at least in part locked in a, an oncogenic state because of the presence of 6-1 restraining myoD at oncogenic loci. And in the absence of 6-1, myoD relocalizes um, to drive differentiation. And so what's the message? The message here is really that rewiring or reprogramming core regulatory circuitries is really capable of producing novel phenotypes. And we can do this either chemically, for example, with retinoic acid and neuroblastoma, or genetically, as we've done in multiple different situations. And this leads to this concept that acquisition of new transcription factor members or loss of old ones leads to new phenotypes. And we're very interested to understand how this can be harnessed for therapeutic benefit, knowing that this is more now than just expression of a target, but rather the activity of that transcription factor, its uh, localization across chromatin, and in fact, who its partners are. And so I, it, what I'd like to do now is move on and talk a little bit about some of the uh, more novel chemical biologic techniques that we've used in order to drug transcription. And, and indeed, uh, in contrast with the sort of smart bomb laser focused approach, really, we have been hard at work building a really very targeted um, well, less targeted nuclear weapons that are, are really designed to drug transcription. And this came out of an initial study where we had thought, is it possible to target the core regulatory circuitry by targeting transcription? And so we had noted that, in fact, all of these core regulatory circuitry transcription factors were driven by super enhancers and were, in fact, themselves transcriptionally regulated. And super enhancers are bound by large amounts of bromodomain containing proteins like BRD4, which recruit the transcriptional complex. And these can be inhibited by small molecules like JQ1. And in fact, folks in, like John Maris and Tim Stegmeier had demonstrated that this compound was uh, effective in suppressing the growth of high risk neuroblastoma cells. Indeed, uh, transcriptional in initiation and elongation is similarly driven by the activity of transcriptional CDKs like CDK7, which phosphorylates the C-terminal tail of RNA polymerase. And folks like Ronnie George had also demonstrated that use of THC1, a small molecule CDK7, 12, and 13 inhibitor, is capable of suppressing this 
um, this function, again, in, in high-risk neuroblastoma. And so we had wondered what it actually would happen if you put the two of these compounds, each individually with some effect in, in high-risk neuroblastoma, what would happen if we put the two of these compounds together? And what we got was this. And so here uh, by spike and microarray, we had demonstrated that combinations of JQ1 and THC1 after an hour really had very few effects on the, on the transcriptome of the cell after four hours had many more effects and really caused global transcriptional collapse after 12 hours of treatment. And when we looked at what the identity of these genes were that were being downregulated, what we found was that after an hour, the genes that were going down the most were all the, the genes of the core regulatory circuitry. And so first, that we were losing the core regulatory circuitry, and, and as we went on to demonstrate next, we were losing essentially most of the genes that were regulated directly by the core regulatory circuitry before eventually uh, we had general transcriptional collapse. And putting these two compounds together in vitro uh, led to very potent synergy, and we were killing these neuroblastoma cell lines. And in fact, when we did this in B2C cell xenografts, um, in vivo in NSG mice, what we saw was that the combination of these two compounds together really led to a striking suppression of tumor growth and, in fact, a prolongation of survival. But these compounds are pretty toxic. And so we wondered, was there a way that we could do even better? Um, could we improve the efficacy of this treatment and also reduce the toxicity? And so we went back to this interaction plot here and noticed that really centrally located within this interaction plot was this protein P300. And P300 is a, a histone acetyl transferase. This is an enzyme that has a paralog, a protein called CBP, and their domain structure is shown here. And these are multi-domain containing proteins, including bromodomains and hat domains, uh, histone acetyl transferase domains. And these proteins in the presence of acetyl-CoA acetylate a number of different target substrates, and this results in the establishment of the H3K27 acetyl mark, which forms a binding spot for bromodomain-containing proteins to drive high-level target gene expression. And so we wondered, was this a potential target um, in high-risk neuroblastoma? And so we went and looked at DEPMAP, and what we saw uh, was rather striking, and that was that the majority of neuroblastoma cell lines, each of them shown here, uh, 19 different neuroblastoma cell lines, the majority of them were dependent, as marked by this darker red color, on P300, but really very few were dependent on this uh, paralog CVP, despite both being expressed. And so we went on to perform low throughput uh, knockout studies and demonstrated that when you knock out P300, you lose the target mark, H3K27 acetylation. And in fact, you also lose expression of really the dominant oncogene in this disease, MCN. When you knock out CBP, on the other hand, you really have neither of these effects. And this translated through into cell growth. Here we noticed that when you knock out P300, the cells grew very poorly, whereas when you knock out CBP, um, they continue to proliferate. And over the years, many folks have developed uh, different compounds that target different aspects of these proteins, including uh, compounds targeting the Kix domain, the Bromo domain, and the HAT domain. And we took a number of these compounds and treated neuroblastoma cells with them and demonstrated that by far the most effective compound was this histone acetyl transferase domain inhibitor called A4A5. And so we were left with this question, well, why, if P300 and CBP are both expressed, why do they play such distinct roles in neuroblastoma? Is it that one of them is mutated? And so we turned to publicly available databases and demonstrated, in fact, while P300 and CBP are, are um, uh, they're almost never uh, mutated in these diseases. It's exceedingly rare. And so we didn't think that was what was going on. We knew that, in fact, uh, there weren't strong expression differences between these proteins. And so we wondered, were they binding to and regulating different targets? And, in fact, we think that that's what's going on. And so we performed ChIP-seq to P300 and CBP and demonstrated that, by and large, these proteins bound at similar loci across the, the um, epigenome. And this uh, correlated with H3K27 acetyl and open chromatin and, in fact, all of the master transcription factors of the core regulatory circuitry. But when we zoomed in specifically on the core regulatory circuitry, what we saw was really striking, and that was that P300 was there, 
shown in, in red, you can see it has similar binding as all of these core regulatory circuitry members, but really CVP was not. And so P300 and CVP both have uh, no sequence specificity to their DNA binding. We wondered um, how, in fact, P300 was getting to DNA. And usually this requires uh, the binding of these different proteins uh, to transcription factors. And so we took the top P300 peaks and the top CBP peaks in combination with Luca Mariani and Martha Bulick's lab and demonstrated actually that these were heavily enriched under P300 uh, peaks for a gene called, uh, or for a, um, a consensus sequence for the transcription factor TFAP2 beta. And when we performed ChIP-seq to TFAP2 beta, it looked exactly like a core regulatory circuitry member. It was binding along with all of the other master transcription factors. And so this led us to this hypothesis that this was actually the escort for P300 to DNA. And so we went on to ask if that was the case. In fact, we suspected that TFAP2 beta would bind to P300. And in fact, in co-IP assays, we demonstrated exactly that. And that was that AP2 beta yeah, bound to P300, but in fact did not bind to CVP. And this then led to the hypothesis that if you knocked out AP2 beta, um, this should lead to a failure to recruit P300 to DNA and therefore loss of H2K27 acetyl. And we went on to perform a number of different experiments uh, showing here when you knock out AP2 beta, that's exactly what you see. You see loss of H2K27 acetyl. This is a, a phenotype that you do not see when you knock out other core regulatory circuitry members. But what we were left with was this idea that what we really wanted to do was to target P300 um, and leave CBP alone. And so here in neuroblastoma, you see P300 binding um, to enhancers and promoters. In normal cells, you have both of these proteins. And we had hypothesized that there, if there was some way that we could target only P300, this would lead to death due to loss of target gene expression in neuroblastoma. Um, and that in normal cells, perhaps we could get some compensation by CBP continuing to function in this role. And so uh, together with Jun Chi uh, at Dana-Farber, um, we uh, developed a, a small molecule uh, that is a form called a PROTAC, uh, or proteolysis targeted chimera. In this model, you have a small molecule that on one side binds to your target of interest. For us, this protein P300, and on the other side binds to an E3 ligase complex, including the protein here, Cerebron. And this leads to a polyubiquitination of your target through the E2 component of this E3 ligase complex, recruitment to the proteasome and proteasomal degradation. And so here you can see the structure of the molecule that we built, our lead molecule. Here's the bait molecule, A485. Um, and we uh, hooked this up to a linker and a small molecule um, imid that uh, binds to the protein cerebron. And we used this compound initially in pull-down assays and demonstrated sort of surprisingly that this compound was capable of physically interacting with P300 proteins, but not with CBP. And this was surprising to us because in fact, this uh, parent molecule, uh, A485, interacts equivalently with both P300 and CBP. And so we went on to perform proteomics to try to identify whether this was in fact true and demonstrated that after 24 hours of treatment here by SILAC labeled nuclear proteomics, that the only significantly downregulated protein was in fact this protein P300 and CBP was really unaffected. And we could see this by Western blotting here over time. After 24 hours, you start to see a weakening of P300 signal, and this is concurrent with activation of cell death as marked by cleaved PARP. We went on to uh, thinking about this um, schema. We went on to, to demonstrate that if you knock out the protein cerebron, that in fact, uh, which we did in, in Kelly cells, um, that this actually uh, results in the generation of an inactive molecule. And so here, um, cerebron is absolutely required uh, for the activity of our protein, uh, of our protec uh, J quad one. We went on to perform uh, chip sequencing uh, using um, in Kelly cells treated with uh, this compound. And what we saw uh, here in these uh, individual plots where each individual dot is a H3K27 acetyl um, individual peak here at zero hours compared to the log tuple change at six and 24 hours. What you can appreciate is that at six hours, we really have very few changes, um, if any, that are significant. Uh, 
And by 20, at this time point, I'll point out that really P300 levels are, are sustained. Here, though, after 24 hours, we have global loss of H3K27 acetylation signal, and at individual loci here, for example, at the core regulatory circuitry locus, um, this super enhancer that drives uh, HAN2 expression, we have really global loss of this signal. And when we quantitated this, we saw after 24 hours of treatment, really that super enhancers were more effective than typical enhancers, although certainly in general, the H3K27 acetyl signal is quite low. And so we wondered what was this doing to cells and, and perhaps not surprisingly, cells without uh, much H3K27 acetyl and, and poor transcriptional output really don't grow very well. Um, and so here, high-risk neuroblastoma cells um, were treated with either uh, active j -clod, um, the uh, parent molecule A485, a stereoisomer of j -clod that's inactive or, or DMSO. And in fact, what we saw was that j -clod was the, the most effective at suppressing growth. This is really driven by apoptotic cell death that's marked by a massive induction of cells in the sub-G1 phase up to 40% after 96 hours. This um, similarly was associated with caspase and PARP cleavage, indicating that this was in fact apoptotic cell death that was seen with loss of the protein uh, P300 and not with catalytic inhibition. And previously we had demonstrated um, that CRISPR knockout of P300 but not CBP led to loss of MCN. And in fact, MCN is a known binding partner of CBP and P300. We wondered if in fact MCN was selectively interacting with P300. We performed co-IP uh, of these two different proteins, demonstrated that P300 physically interacts with MCN. And perhaps not surprisingly, when you degrade uh, uh, P300 here with j -quad, you lose MCN expression, whereas when you catalytically inhibit at short time periods, you really see no effect at all on MCN. And so this led us to a model whereby P300 is really uh, performing two different functions in high-risk neuroblastoma. It's establishing these um, lineage-specifying enhancers and and in it with its catalytic function, and it's also forming a scaffold for MCN to drive enhancer invasion. And in fact, in neuroblastoma, both of these different roles matter. And so I, we wondered, in fact, was, was this actually just a MCN story? Um, was the whole effect really driven by MCN? And so in order to get at that, we established cell lines that overexpressed MCN and then treated them with J-clot. And while we saw a little bit of blunting of this effect, really it didn't explain everything. And so with John Easton's group here at St. Jude, we performed a technique called SLAMSEQ to measure nascent RNA uh, production in the presence uh, or absence of either A485 or j -clot. So we either catalytically inhibited or degraded P300 and then looked to see what was happening to nascent transcription. And we were struck by the finding that j -quad was causing a massive downregulation of gene expression. This is whole transcriptome nascent RNA sequencing that you're seeing here um, with a, an average log twofold change of negative one uh, for j -quad treated samples with really very minor effects with catalytic inhibition. And the genes that were downregulated were enriched for dependency genes. And in fact, when we went back to our string database diagram, here all of these genes individually required for suppression of neuroblast or for promotion of neuroblastoma growth. What was J quad doing? J quad was affecting these circled genes. And so really this was a, a nuclear weapon aimed right at the core regulatory circuitry. So what was this doing in vivo? Uh, we wondered, could we use this in vivo? And so we established Kelly cell xenografts, and we uh, treated these tumors in um, NSG mice with j -quad and demonstrated, again, a blunting of tumor growth um, with this first-generation molecule prolongation of survival. And what I was most struck by was really how well-tolerated this compound was. Um, we really saw very few side effects uh, associated with this, and all of that is really detailed in this cancer discovery paper, which is online now. When we took out the tumors, we saw a loss of P300 immunostain with retained CDP immunostain. This was uh, really enriched by gene set enrichment analysis for MYC targets, and when we zoomed in on the core regulatory circuitry in vivo, what we saw was really a loss of uh, transcription members of the core regulatory circuitry. And so 
uh, with that, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, just summarize and say really the messages from today is, uh, is that um, lineage specific transcription factors are really these key targets in pediatric solid tumors and um, that they function to form these core regulatory circuitries that establish the transcriptional landscape and become dysregulated in cancer in a multitude of different ways. And that, as we've shown using retinoic acid and genetic approaches, but indeed our, our new first-generation molecule of JQuad1, that targeting these circuitries is increasingly becoming possible and is, is able to achieve a therapeutic window. And so this is that same schema um, outlining uh, sort of where we were starting with this clinical problem of high-risk neuroblastoma and using this to derive new therapeutic targets that ultimately has resulted in, in really a deepening understanding of cell state manipulation and chemical targeting. And moving forward, we're interested at, at developing ways to better target, to combine with conventional agents, and to understand how cell state impacts upon chemoresistance. And so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, essentially stop and acknowledge everybody in my lab, um, our collaborators, notably Jun Chi, uh, Brian Abraham, uh, Mark Zimmerman, Nikesh Daria, folks uh, such as Tom Look, Kim Stegmaier, and Rick Young, a number of folks uh, externally uh, who this really has been a, a team effort, and it really does take a village. Um, including uh, folks like Heida Ford and Kristen Artinger, who we worked on uh, rapamycin sarcoma with, and a number of folks internal to St. Jude. Of course, all of our funding sources. Of course, Alex's lemonade stand for um, inviting me to speak today. And I'll just finish with one quick plug and say, if, if you heard something here today that you liked and you're interested, please do send me an email. My email address is here. Um, this is our lab Twitter account. And, and in fact, um, here you can see our lab website. Um, we, uh, this is my lab here with um, a number of different uh, postdocs, uh, senior scientists, and, and graduate students. And um, hopefully, uh, just to uh, end the talk, I, I'd like to say hopefully you liked what you heard here today, and, and we're pretty excited about it, um, and hopefully you didn't think it was a lemon. Um, and so uh, with that, I will uh, stop. Wow. I, li I like the lecture, and I like I like ending with a joke. That was great. <laughs> um, amazing talk. So we're low on time, but we have, a, we have at least four questions in already, so maybe we could jump right in. Sure, sure, please. Um, do you want me to read them to you, or do you see them there? Um, let me see if I can pull up uh, the – here we go. Um, yes, I can I can see them. So uh, it looks like the first one um, says, uh, from Charolampos Lazarus, uh, it says, thank you, Adam, nice talk. I'm wondering to what extent the dependency on core regulatory circuitry members that you see in cell lines still holds in the case of preclinical models such as mice. If this is indeed the case, are there any side effects since these factors are frequently important for lineage specification and cell state? Um, so this is an excellent question. And um, we are interested in examining these, uh, these same questions. Um, we, we have not uh, personally interrogated the function of these uh, core regulatory circuitry members in genetic models in mice, although we're certainly interested in doing that. And you're absolutely right, these are important for lineage specification and cell state. In fact, um, a good example of this is HAND2, which is involved in generation of neural crest cells, but also in cardiac looping. So targeting HAND2 might, in fact, have some effects on the myocardium. And so we are we are uh, thoughtful about these these sort of approaches and trying to limit um, toxicity, but uh, certainly um, I think more to come uh, about that. Um, it looks like the uh, second question uh, from John Bushweller: uh, six transcription factors bind to phosphatase IL-1, which is essential for their transcriptional activity. There's some tool compound inhibitors for IL-1 phosphatase activity reported. Have we tried these with neuroblastoma? Um, we have uh, not yet, in fact, tried these in neuroblastoma. We we believe that six uh, transcription factors are actually um, they don't seem to be dependencies in high-risk neuroblastoma, but rather in rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. And what I will say is that we have an ongoing uh, collaboration with Haida Ford and Kristen Artinger um, uh, to ask essentially exactly those questions in rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. Um, so 
you know, a lot of this is hot off the presses and, and, and a lot more to come. Um, but absolutely, we think that this is a, a potentially tractable approach in rapid sarcoma. Um, another, uh, another, uh, talk, a uh, question, why do you think JQuad is, uh, specific to CDP? Um, we think that, um, in fact, JQuad is specific to P300, not, not CBP, although we are developing, um, along with June Chi's lab, some compounds that are selective for CBP. Um, we believe that this has to do with, uh, three-dimensional structure and how the compound forms a ternary complex between P300 or CBP and bridges this to the E3 ligase complex. Um, unfortunately, P300 and CBP are enormous proteins, um, over 300 kilodaltons, and haven't been fully crystallized. And so we've started to think about um, uh, using approaches like cryo-EM in order to try and solve this ternary structure. Um, but right now, we think that this is a um, is probably a three-dimensional interaction uh, that is promoting uh, binding from one to the other. Um, uh, Gabrielle Bouchel says, uh, the in vivo data you showed are all in NSG mice. Did you also test the protagon in immune competent model because down regulation of MCM could be beneficial for immune recognition? You guys are, are picking up on everything that we're planning to do. So this is, this is fantastic. So in fact, um, we have not yet tested this in an immune competent model. Um, one of the, uh, one of the issues that we identified in the cancer discovery paper was in fact, um, that this is exceptionally challenging to do because of the fact that, um, that uh, humans developed a mutation in the cerebellum gene that actually changes substrate specificity. And so JQuad works differently in human cells than it does in, in mouse cells. And so uh, we have been hard at work trying to develop immune competent models with the mutation already in there so that they're in a sense humanized to ask those sorts of questions. Um, but uh, but we agree this is a, a really exciting potential um, avenue, especially for the for the uh, potential treatment um, of uh, patients with high risk of neuroblastoma. Um, wow, they keep coming. How's, how yeah. Are you? yeah, there's there's, <laughs> there's a few. Do you have time for a few more? There's a few. I, more. I'm happy. I'm happy to stay on and, and, okay. and talk more. So so um, over in the over in the chat, there's a couple. Uh, Beth Lawler. Um, posted one and said, hi, Adam, really great, exciting work. Do you think the selective P300 versus CBP dependency in, in neuroblastoma is going to be observed in other transcriptionally addicted cancers? That That is a great question. Um, and so, I, you know, one of the things that we did to try and get at this, so the answer is yes. Um, I, I think that there is going to be biased dependency on either P300 or CBP in different types of cancer. Um, one of the approaches that we took in the cancer discovery paper was to ask when you look across all cancer cell lines in, um, in DEPMAP and then also uh, performing large uh, screens using JQuad, um, what we had identified was that actually almost about a third of human cancer cell lines now are genetically dependent on P300. So in the initial demonstration, when there were many fewer cell lines in DEPMAP, we thought P300 was actually laser-specific for high-risk neuroblastoma. But DEPMAP is a living, breathing thing. And as more cell lines go into this screen, we're identifying different things. And so we were actually very excited to see that P300 is now a dependency in many more different types of cancer, including things like osteosarcoma, um, in some cases, rhabdomyosarcoma. And so we're very interested to try and pull that apart and ask what are the, the things that really drive P300 dependency versus CBP or, in fact, either of those. Um, so more, more to come on that, but I think that the answer to that question really is likely to be yes. 